Well, good morning, everyone. It's um, great to see you again. Uh, before we start um, our time together in God's Word, let me just remind you one or two things to look at for us, if you can. Uh, make sure you pick up the bulletin. It's been sent as an attachment to you. Um, and on the bulletin this week, specifically, there will, of course, be people to pray for. But what we'll also have is some details of how uh, we will manage next week, Easter week. Um, it is traditionally our time for prayer. And so we will be thinking about how we can pray more together during the course of the week. And so there'll be some information for you to read in the bulletin to help you with that. And then a Good Friday service as well, uh, held in conjunction with uh, Bank Hall, uh, a, a joint effort together. And hopefully you'll hear a little bit from Paul Kinnaird um, with us uh, next Friday. And we'll get that out to you in time for Friday morning uh, for the 10.30 service. Um, next week. So uh, good to see you. Uh, good morning to you all, wherever you are. Um, and as you listen to God's word today, uh, trust that you are well and you will be well blessed uh, of God by his spirit. Let me read for you. Um, it's a well-known passage of scripture. It's a well-known story. It's found in the book of Luke, uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 1 to 10. Of course, it's the story of Jesus and his encounter with Zacchaeus and you will know that well. Uh, but that story in its whole is not directly our focus uh, for this morning. It's more to do with the mission of Jesus. Why did Jesus come? So we're going to have a look um, at the reading together, and then I'll pray for us as we continue. So Bible's open, uh, Luke chapter 19, and I will begin to read from verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. But the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Amen. Let's pray as we look at God's Word together. Heavenly Father, I know and we know as we gather together this morning in our homes, uh, wherever we're found, whether we're listening or watching, Lord, you are with us, and we are glad of that. Your Spirit lives in us, dwells in us, and Lord, is in us to bless us this morning and to encourage us in our faith, encourage us in our walk with you, and even, Lord, to bring salvation and bring hope to those who are lost. And so, Lord, we pray that you give us listening ears. We'd hear the challenge of your word. And Lord, that you'd encourage our hearts, we pray tonight, today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I wonder if you've got a list of things that you would like, like to do, things that you'd, you'd like to achieve. Places to visit, maybe. Um, commonly known today, maybe, as a, as a bucket list. Things to do before you kick the bucket. Things you do before you die. I've certainly no wish to jump out of a plane and skydive. Uh, I've got no wish to bungee jump off the highest bridge or climb the highest of mountains, swim with sharks. In fact, to me, they seem far more likely to bring my life to an end quicker than it naturally would. The thing about Jesus is this. When he came, he didn't have a bucket list, if you like, 
of things he would like to achieve whilst he was here on earth. In his ministry, Jesus was resolutely set on one thing. It was his mission. It was his focus. It was the very purpose that he came into the world to bring life to sinners, to bring rescue for those who are far from God, those who strayed from God. In fact, the Bible describes them as those who are lost. And it was a mission that no amount of popularity could persuade him to divert from. In fact, he would speak to people and say, don't tell anybody what I'm doing or what I've done. Why? Because he didn't want the crowds to, to, to almost unfocus his mind from the task that he had in hand. He wasn't to be persuaded by those closest to him, who when he set his mind to Jerusalem would say to him, no, Jesus, this is not going to happen to you. He had this one focus, this one purpose, and it was an all-consuming purpose for Jesus, and it was come to save a lost world. Everything he did, was focused on that purpose. Every miracle, every healing, every sermon he preached, every person he spoke with, all with the purpose of reaching out to a lost world and longing that they would be saved, longing that they would come to know him as their savior. And we'll remember, won't we, and we've said this many a time before, that when Jesus was born, and the message came to, to the angels, you will call him Jesus. Why? Because he will rescue his people from their sins. He's a savior. That's what his name means. And so what we mustn't read in the Gospels is this, that Jesus was a good moral teacher. Yes, he taught morals, but not with the purpose of making us morally better. Jesus didn't come to bring about religious reform. Jesus didn't come just to make society a better place to live in. Although all of those things would be a consequence of people coming to faith and trust in him. No, Jesus came to save us from our sin so that we could live with him for all eternity. And that was his purpose. And we find that clearly stated in the reading that we had before from uh, Luke 19, the story of Zacchaeus. After meeting up with Zacchaeus, Jesus states this in verse 10, for the Son of Man, a title that Jesus gave to himself, a title that was there in the Old Testament for Jesus, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, was society better for a chain Zacchaeus? Yes, of course it was. Was Zacchaeus morally better because Jesus changed his life? Yes, of course he was. The evidence was there in the story. He gave money back. He repented of his sin. His life was changed. People were blessed through his life. But those things only came as a result of Jesus' purpose being fulfilled. A changed heart, a new heart, a new life. A saved Zacchaeus. The Apostle Paul puts it like this when he writes uh, to Timothy in 1 Timothy uh, chapter uh, 1 verse 15. He puts Jesus' mission like this. He says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of which he says, I am the worst. It deserves our full attention. Here's the statement about who Jesus is and why he came. He came into the world to save sinners, sinners, period. We know that Jesus was heading to Jerusalem. That's the journey we've been thinking about the last few weeks. And we know that at Jerusalem, Jesus had already said on a number of occasions that the cross awaited 
and so much cruelty awaited. But we also know that he said after three days he would rise again. And this meeting with Zacchaeus that recorded through his hair is his last encounter on the way to Jerusalem. Next stop was Jerusalem. But what an encounter it was. Jesus deliberately and purposefully seeks out a thief, a traitor, a man who was despised by his own people, the Jews. And in this story, we have a brilliant picture of Jesus' mission to seek and save the lost. Zacchaeus was not even accepted by his own people. Considered a traitor because he worked for the Romans. Considered a thief because he milked the taxes off his own people and made a fortune for himself. And yet Jesus purposefully enters Jericho, meets a blind man on the way in, and on the way out has arranged an appointment, a divine appointment with Zacchaeus. And this mission of Jesus is not a new type of mission which we just see towards the end of his life. This mission of Jesus was, was right very there in the very beginning, way back in Genesis. It's a God-ordained mission. And we find the scene in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. And we find in the garden here that God is walking around the garden, seeking out, looking for Adam and Eve, who'd sinned, who'd disobeyed God, who'd wandered away from Him, who'd chosen to go their own way. In fact, literally the way of the devil and against God. And God asks this question, where are you? He seeks them out. He knows now that Adam and Eve are lost in sin. He knows now that death is what is going to come their way and has come their way through sin. And these are my words here, I'm looking for you. You've wandered away. You've rejected my way. You've refused my word. Where are you? I want to bring you back. And this is God at work. And it's continued ever since. The brilliant chapter in the book of Ezekiel. If you've got Bibles open and you're able to turn to it, do so. But I'll just scan read some of the verses for you. Ezekiel chapter 34. And it's a long section that we can read. In fact, we could read the whole chapter. But Ezekiel picks up this thread brilliantly. And this is what he says. God is speaking. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Sovereign Lord, he's in control. He's ruler over all. He has all things in his hands. And this is what the sovereign Lord says. Verse 11. I myself will search for my sheep. I will look after them. I will rescue them. I will gather them. I will pasture them. I will tend them. I myself will make them lie down. And let me just read verse 16. It says this, I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. And over in verse 23 and 24 of the same chapter, we have this picture. The a servant of David, Jesus himself, is this shepherd who will come and be this to people. I will place them over one shepherd, my servant David. Of course, David is long dead. And it's speaking of Jesus, the Messiah, to come. And my servant David, and he will tend them. And he will be their shepherd. What a brilliant picture we have of the mission of Jesus and God's mission right from the very beginning. Where are you? 
He seeks out the lost, and He looks for the strays. And of course, Luke picks up this thread in Luke chapter 15. We're not going to go there, in, but just worthwhile pointing out three stories about something that was lost. A lost sheep, a lost coin, lost sons, and the rejoicing when they are found and they are brought back. And Jesus on this final few miles before he arrives in Jerusalem, sees a helpless, lonely, lost man, a hated man, and he changed his life forever. We know the story of Zacchaeus well. It's, it's familiar to us. You've already said a Jew working for the Romans, fleecing his own people, taking more in taxes than he ought, and making sure he pockets a plenty himself. But for some reason, Zacchaeus was desperate to see Jesus. And all the quorum went out the window. He hitched up his clothes, he, he ran ahead of the crowd, he climbs up a tree. But little did Zacchaeus know at that point that Jesus' very purpose in traveling through his town that day was to see him. He already knew his name. He knew the place where he would encounter him underneath the tree and he would look up and he would call out, Zacchaeus! He knew that his command, I must stay at your house today, couldn't be refused. And would result in the words of Jesus found in verse 9 and 10. It's worth reading them again. Jesus said to Zacchaeus, Today, salvation has come to this house, to your heart, to your life. Because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Jesus is in no doubt. Zacchaeus' life has been changed completely. He is now a true son of Abraham. Not through ethnicity, not through nationalistic identity, not because he's, he's given up working for the Romans. No, it's a spiritual identity. To be a true son of Abraham is a spiritual identity and it's marked out by faith and trust in Christ Jesus. And that is the mark of all who belong and are the family of Abraham. Faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He's saved owing to an encounter with Jesus who seeks him out, who goes looking for him, who walks through Jericho just so as he gets to the end of the town and he's on his way out, he will meet this man. And he saves him. And he brings him into his kingdom. Do you know that for yourself personally? as you sit and listen this morning, are you sure and certain that you've had an encounter with Jesus and He's changed your life and He's invited you to come and eat with Him? And your response to Him is to be immediately to come down off the tree and a life is changed and someone is born again? Do you know that for yourself? And remember, it's all because of Jesus and not because of you. It was all because of Jesus and not because of Zacchaeus. He's a sinner, the crowd said. Does Jesus know who he's gone to be with? Do you know that you are lost and Jesus has came to seek you out? might be good for us for a moment or two just to think through what it means to be lost. 
wonder if you have ever been lost in, in everyday life. We can wander around in a lost world sometimes, but have you actually been physically lost? As a child in a shop, vague recollection of being lost and in tears because I can't find my parents. I've certainly been lost in a car. I've not known where to go. But instead of stopping and asking for directions, as a proud man, I can sort it out. I know where I'm going. If, if it just turned down here, I'm sure this brings us onto this road. Many a time, being lost in the car, not knowing where to go next. Lost on holiday. Remember a time going to Greece on the mainland, going out for a run, pre-mobile phones, pre any of that era. And going for an early morning run because the temperatures were so hot. So out in the morning, five in the morning. And running up the back way, up through the hills, and then down into the town. But when I got into the town, I got lost. And didn't know where I was. And I found myself actually cornered by a pack of wild dogs. Frighten the life out of me. Not just the dogs, but the fact that I was lost. And I didn't know which way to go. It's disorientating. It becomes frightening. It becomes really fearful. And it's certainly not a pleasant experience, whatever the level of lostness you found yourself in. Here's what the Bible means by being lost. And it's not pleasant. And it's not, not easy listening. It's fearful. Lost describes a person who does not know God does not have a relationship with God. It, it, it's not about how good someone is or isn't. It's not about how kind or gentle someone may or may not be. It's not about how spiritual or religious somebody is. Lost literally means lost. They do not have a relationship with God. They've wandered away from God, like Adam and Eve, chosen to go their own way. And although they think... They are running their own lives. Actually, it's Satan behind it all. And although they don't know it, Satan is their Lord and the controller of their lives. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says as he writes to a number of churches at different times and he explains to them about what it means to be lost. To the church in Rome, he wrote this in chapter 3, verse 11. There is no one who understands and there is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. We don't seek after Him. In our lostness, we are satisfied with our own life and our own ways. To the church in Ephesus, he wrote, Remember, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship, foreigners to the promises of God without hope and without God that's what you were before you had an encounter with Jesus in other words lost completely utterly lost without Christ and it doesn't get any easier in our readings here is the outcome for the lost the context is a letter that Paul wrote to a church in Thessalonica. Church was asking questions, or Paul was addressing questions about life after death, the second coming. And this is what he says in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8 and 9. God is just in all his dealings, he's saying, and he will bring relief to the people. 
the lost, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. Boy, that's fearful, isn't it? To be lost is disastrous. God will punish those who do not know Him and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out in the presence of the Lord. God takes lostness extremely seriously. Sadly for us, we don't. In fact, we actually think everything will be all right in the end. And we'll have seen that in different reactions to COVID-19. Very relevant to us right at this moment, isn't it? We will see people who are just not taking it seriously. And we'll look at them and we go, serious? Do you think that's acceptable given all the instructions that we've had? And there'll be others who will take it seriously and there'll be different degrees. But let's not make any mistake about this. God takes lostness seriously, extremely. And if you're lost today, if you're not in a relationship with Jesus today, then know this, that the ending is not a good ending. as two Thessalonians explained to us a moment or two ago. Well, here's the good news. And let me give you some good news, because there is good news. And it's the story that Zacchaeus brings to us, and it brings great hope to us. Why? Because Jesus had set his mind on going to Jerusalem, and he knew what was going to happen. He knew that death awaited him there. But in his death and in his resurrection, we have the fulfillment of God's great rescue plan. A Savior who has come to save his people from their sins. The very name Jesus himself. And he would do it by the greatest act of sacrifice the world has ever seen. And by the greatest power on display in the raising of Jesus to new life. And Easter beckons, doesn't it? It's around the corner. Good Friday is just a few days away. Where Christ cries out your name. And Christ cries out my name. And he says, I've come for you. I've come to seek after you. I've come to save you. I've come to die for you. And on the cross, he asks this question, won't you hear my voice? Won't you see my love for you? Won't you heed my call? Won't you accept my invitation to come to your house and eat with you and to dine with you? And just as Cuz Friday comes, remember from last week, God is a day three God. Jesus is a day three person. And Easter Sunday is around the corner where Christ is no longer found in a tomb. He's alive. The resurrected Jesus, the defeater of death and the defeater of sin, he's alive. And therefore there is great hope. There is great hope for me in my lostness. And there is great hope for you in your lostness. And it's to be found in Jesus Christ. Will you not hear his call? Will you not heed his cry? There were some in the crowd that day in Jericho who mocked Jesus. They ridiculed him. They rejected him. 
and they rejected his view of them that they were lost. They thought they were okay. They thought they were good enough. But gladly in the crowd that day, there was one man who knew he needed rescue. And he knew who the rescuer was. And he heard the voice of Jesus as Jesus says to him, Zacchaeus, come down off the tree. Come on, because today I'm coming to your house. I want to spend time with you. I want to eat together. And Zacchaeus came down from the tree and welcomed Jesus gladly. And his life was changed forever. Will you hear the call of Jesus? Have you strayed and gone away with a sheep that's wandered and gone off? He's calling you back. He's the great shepherd. He'll go and look for the one sheep, even though there's 99 in the fold. He'll go and look for you. And he's speaking to you today. And he longs to bring you back. Are you completely lost in your sin? Are you completely lost and have no thought of God? But your heart has been pricked by what you've heard. Your conscience has been sparked. And you know that you're not perfect. You know that you need rescue. And you've resisted the call of Jesus on your life. Was today the day that salvation comes to your house? Is today the day you hear the words of Jesus to come down out of your tree so he can dine with you? And it can change your life forever. How will you respond? How will I respond to him this morning? Your status is not the issue. Your standing in society is not the issue. Your good works are not the issue. Your heart is the issue. The invitation comes from God to call upon His name. Will you stop long enough to hear His voice? And how will you respond to Him this morning? Let me pray for us as we close. Heavenly Father, help us to hear, to truly hear your voice this morning. And remind us again that you have come to seek us out. Forgive us, forgive me for my wanderings. Forgive me that I have gone astray and bring me back. And that might be our prayer, that might be the prayer of many. Lord, bring us back to you that we might look only to Jesus. Lord, we might be lost and have never walked with you. Lord, help us to hear your invitation to come to the cross today and to know in Christ Jesus a Savior, a rescuer who has come to save me, us, a lost world from our sin and from our wanderings away from God. Hear our prayer, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.